As we saw earlier, a black hole with the mass of the Sun is only about 2 miles or 3 kilometers in diameter. The Earth, Moon, and Sun are really big compared to that. Also, a black hole is something that doesn't, by definition, emit light. So how do we see something that's really, really small and doesn't emit or reflect any light? And to actually find and witness a black hole and its effects would be amazing. To that end, astronomers have to look for the effects on their surroundings. A black hole in a binary star system may orbit close enough to its companion to draw material off the neighboring star and into a spiraling disk, like you see here. As the gas would spiral inward, friction would cause it to heat up to millions of Kelvin, hot enough to emit X-rays. Such companion stars would be seen to astrometrically wobble in the sky, just like any other binary star system. But when something is too small to see, but as the mass of the Sun are greater, the spatially tiny object would turn its companion into what we call a single-line spectroscopic binary. We would observe the spectral lines from such a star to alternately blue shift and red shift in a regular way. Most of these are indirect measurements, as they don't directly measure the event horizon. Also, X-ray binaries could contain a neutron star rather than a black hole. However, there are two ways of directly measuring black holes that have only recently come into being. The first one is the measurement of gravitational waves, whose wave patterns, intensity, and frequency can only be created by mergers of ultra-compact, massive objects like some pairing of black holes or neutron stars. Last, and most recently, is the direct imaging of the shadow of an accretion disk around a supermassive black hole. The radio images, along with the polarimetry to show the ambient magnetic fields, conclusively show the existence of such objects close up. Let's review all three. The first place we can look for black holes is in binary star systems. Binary star systems make up a large proportion of stars in the sky, so we might expect to have some binary stars where one of the stars is very massive, goes through a catastrophic core collapse supernova, and forms a black hole. As a result of this evolution, its companion star will likely change its evolutionary path, becoming more massive due to the accumulation of material from the violent formation process of the black hole. As it does so, the secondary star evolves rapidly into a giant and fills its Roche lobe, which demarks the gravitational balance point between the star and the black hole. Matter crosses the balance point as the star expands in the throes of its red giant instabilities, dumping it into an accretion disk around the black hole. As this gas spirals in, friction causes it to get hotter and hotter into millions of Kelvin and hot enough to emit X-rays. The spectroscopy of the optical companion star is important here. The X-ray emission would tell us that some compact object lies there, but it is the observation of the spectrum of the visible star that can tell us the mass of the presumed black hole. The visible star is usually either a high-mass O star or Wolf-Rayette star, or it's a low-mass red giant or main sequence star. The spectral lines of the optical visible star will redshift and blue shift in a regular manner, which is interpreted as a Doppler shift as the star orbits its massive tiny companion. As of this video recording, there are about 4,000 X-ray binaries known to exist, but only about 220 of the optical counterpart stars have been cataloged in the AAVSO and GCVS standard community databases for variable stars. It is from this data set of known X-ray binaries that we confirm the optical counterpart's properties. You'll see in the literature and poking around that there are roughly two types of X-ray binaries, high mass and low mass. This designation is not about the black hole, but rather about the star dumping stuff onto the black hole. When it's high mass, that's the O star or wolf rayette. They're bright enough to actually measure the star spectra. But the low mass candidates are basically only detectable in X-rays. So, for these, we frequently know very little about the donor star. The X-ray emission dominates the electromagnetic output from the pair in both cases. We looked at spectroscopic binaries back in my previous video on binary stars, but let's review it quickly here. In the case of high-mass X-ray binary, the optical star is an O star wolf rayette, and these types of stars are very bright, which means we can see a continuum spectrum. And these stars also commonly have emission lines and only a few absorption lines. So for this example, we'll focus on the emission lines. Let's say that the black hole in the binary is the black dot, and the yellowish dot is our hot, optically visible star. 
As these stars orbit their common center of mass, we see the emission lines redshifted and blue shifted compared to the laboratory reference frame. When the visible star is moving away, as in part one, then we get a redshift. When it's moving towards the observer in its orbit, then we get a blue shift. This makes the determination of the black hole's mass easier. If we have a decent measure of masses of from other O-type stars to apply here, then we can use this Doppler change to determine the orbital speed. Furthermore, from a detailed light curve, we can hopefully get the orbital parameters and the inclination of the orbit to the line of sight. This will then give us the masses of the two stars using Kepler's third law. If we have a good spectrum to mass relationship via a well-calibrated HR diagram, that gets us the mass of the O star and then the mass of the black hole. You can see there's a lot of measurements to go into this analysis. Next, what do we mean by filling the Roche lobe? This diagram shows the gravitational equipotentials of both the black hole on the left and the donor star on the right. There's also a line connecting their centers of mass, which would be their orbital plane seen edge on. Now, both objects have roughly circular rings of gravitational potential around them. This means an arrow from each ring points down towards the star at a right angle from the ring. Each arrow on a given ring represents the same pull of gravity, and the length of the arrow represents the strength of gravity's pull at that location, and the direction of the arrow always points towards the center of mass. If we move to an inner ring, the arrows would still point inward, but they would be longer to show the increased strength of gravity. If we go farther out, the arrows would still point towards the center of mass, but the arrows would be shorter to reflect the lessening pull of gravity at the greater distance. Now we look at the special crossing point between the two stars' gravitational potentials. This is the L1 Lagrange point, and it's where the gravitational force is completely balanced between the two stars. The green arrow points to this balanced spot, where if you just placed an object, it wouldn't fall either way. The figure eight shape marked by the heavy white line and the red arrows is the maximum size the star can have before the material crosses the L1 point. The lobes of the figure eight are called the star's Roche lobe. They mark the physically largest points where all the material of the star is fully bound only to one central star. We know that as stars evolve, they will grow in radius, not in mass, since being big here is a function of the gas's temperature and luminosity. The star here has swollen to nearly fill its Roche lobe, and we learned about this kind of evolution back in my videos on the future of the sun. Finally, the star has evolved to become physically large enough to fill its entire Roche lobe. The shape of the star is no longer spherical because the gravitational influence of the nearby companion black hole has changed the gravitational equipotential of the entire system. If the star gets any bigger, which it presumably will, then some of the star will cross into the black hole's Roche lobe limit and fall towards it. The star would then become so big that its outermost layers are not held onto it alone. They are held instead inside the peanut-shaped outer gravitational equipotential lines. This simulation shows the effect of this late-type giant star overfilling its Roche lobe. Some material crosses the L1 point, which is the natural dumping point through which all the material would likely squirt. The simulation also adds in the effects of their orbit, and since they orbit a common center of mass, or barycenter, we see that the black hole must be much more massive than the star, because the black hole isn't moving as much as the big star. The angular momentum of the gas from the star is retained as it falls across the Lagrange point, creating what's called an accretion disk around the black hole. And that gas gets to millions of Kelvin in temperature as it spirals in, emitting the X-rays that we observe. In this simulation by NASA's Scientific Visualization Studio, we see the motion of the X-ray binary XTE J1550-564, otherwise known as V3081 Norma. The binary star system is composed of a black hole around 10 times the mass of the sun, and the star in this case is a K3 giant. Additionally, not shown in this simulation, the black hole of jet fires out jets of matter along strong magnetic field created by the inner accretion disk, and it's also known as a microquasar. These X-ray binaries all emit a majority of the radiation in the X-ray part of the spectrum. The X-ray emission is generally thought to be the result of accretion of matter from the normal star onto the compact object. If such a system emits signals that can be directly traced to the compact object, 
and it can't be a black hole, but rather it'll be a neutron star. However, we can lock in the black hole nature of such stellar mass black holes by the spectroscopic analysis I just described. By studying the companion star, we get the orbital parameters of the system and obtain an estimate for the mass of the compact object. If this mass is much larger than the tolman oppenheimer volkoff limit, this is the maximum mass a star can have without collapsing, then the object can't be a neutron star. That leaves us with our black hole as our only current option. Quark stars and their ilk are still in their infancy of understanding, therefore the black hole paradigm for the massive compact object is the current understanding. The tolman oppenheimer volkoff limit is currently known to be between about two and 2.2 solar masses. But for most astronomers, the ambiguity is removed if the compact object is above three solar masses. A three solar mass neutron star just can't exist in nature. Though we have good confirmations of only a few dozen solar mass black holes with mass ranges between about four and 20 solar masses, it's thought that there should be about a billion such stellar mass black holes in our Milky Way. This number comes from the expected initial mass function of stellar evolution for the composition and population of known Milky Way stars. These black holes would have been formed from titanic supernova events. Since black holes are quite small and don't emit light, they reveal themselves only by interacting with a star or gas nearby. Now let's take a look at some known candidates. 